Um, today we'll, we'll introduce the first, uh, the hitchhike system, the first backstage system, this guy, which enables the backstage communication using commercial Wi-Fi devices. This is joint work with uh, Dinesh, Kiran, and Sachin from Stanford and MIT. And we have uh, put the Wi-Fi radios in many of the embedded systems, like the thermal stack sensor, the wristband, the smartwatch, the smartphone. Wi-Fi has become one of the dominant radios that we use for connecting the internet. However, Wi-Fi consumes lots of power during the transmission. This table shows that the power consumption of the Wi-Fi radios versus the other components in a embedded system. We can see that roughly the Wi-Fi consumes several hundreds of milliwatts of power. It's five orders of magnitude larger compared to a, a simple accelerometer sensor. Four orders of magnitude uh, power compared to a microphone sensor. Three orders of magnitude more power compared to a microcontroller. And two orders of magnitude more power compared to the SRAM uh, storage unit. As a result, when we use a Wi-Fi radio to transmit information, we have to think about how much power will be consumed for this single bit transmission. Ideally, for a low power embedded system, we want to have some radio like this, which only consume microwatts of power. How to build this radio? How to build such microwatts radio? Before diving into the radio design, Let's first discuss why Wi-Fi consumes so much power. Any idea here? This figure shows the major modules within a Wi-Fi transmission or reception chain. It majorly composes three major modules. The first module is called the baseband processing. It will generate the baseband Wi-Fi analog signals like the OFDM signals or 11B baseband signals. The second part is the oscillator plus the mixture circuits. It moved the baseband Wi-Fi signal into 2.4 gigahertz signal and transmit out. The third module here is amplifier. You want to amplify the Wi-Fi signal before you push the signal into the antenna. Unfortunately, each module here each of the three modules here consume lots of power. The combination of the three modules here contributes to several hundreds of milliwatts of power consumption of the Wi-Fi radio. So how to do Wi-Fi transmission while consuming only microwatts of power? How to do that? Well, if you want to do Wi-Fi transmission with microwatts power consumption, you cannot have the baseband processing. You cannot run Wi-Fi baseband processing. You cannot have a oscillator plus mixture surface to move the signal to the 2.4 gigahertz. And you cannot run amplifier. The only thing that you can keep is just a very simple Wi-Fi antenna. What you do, what we do is that we put this antenna into a small device called backscatter tag. Backscatter tags work in this way. It takes the incoming signal, what we call excitation signal. This backscatter tag here is able to convert and reflect this excitation signal to a Wi-Fi receiver. During the reflection, this special tag is able to convert the incoming signal into a Wi-Fi signal. As a result, the receiver here the Wi-Fi receiver will observe the reflected backscatter Wi-Fi signal. So, because the signal reflection only consumes microwatts of power consumption, if we can build a system that enables this vision, then we can do Wi-Fi transmission with microwatts power consumption. The question here is how to generate the excitation signal. Well, one of the previous work, Passive Wi-Fi, published in NSDI this year, give one possible answer. The answer here is that you go to the store, you buy a very special device called plug-in device here. This special device generates a sine wave signal. 
It's a pure single tone signal. Then the passive Wi-Fi tag here is able to convert the sine wave signal into a Wi-Fi signal and reflect this Wi-Fi signal back to the Wi-Fi receiver. When the Wi-Fi receiver re received the backscattered, backscattered Wi-Fi signal, then it's able to decode the tag information. It's a great idea. However, it needs to go to the store, buy the special hardware, deploy this special hardware. Such extra hardware is an extra de deployment overhead. How is it possible for us to enable the same vision without deploying additional hardware? Well, we look around. What radios do we have? Well, we have Wi-Fi radios, right? We always have Wi-Fi wi wi radios around us. So, can we just use Wi-Fi radios to enable the same vision? We take one Wi-Fi transmitter here. This Wi-Fi transmitter transmits a Wi-Fi signal. The tag reflects the Wi-Fi signal to a Wi-Fi receiver. During the signal reflection, the tag somehow embeds its information. How to do this? That's our system, Hitchhike, the first backscatter system that is able to enable backscatter communication using commercial Wi-Fi devices without deploying any hardware, without doing any hardware modification. In order to build this device, we make two technical contributions. The first one is code word translation, which enables the backside communication between Wi-Fi radios. The second one is single sideband backscatter, which significantly improves the backscatter spectrum efficiency. We will discuss each of them. But first, let's look at how the Wi-Fi works. When the Wi-Fi transmits a packet, essentially it's a one and zero sequence. When the Wi-Fi transmits data one, it essentially transmits, it's not actually transmitting data one, it's actually transmitting a code word. For example, in this, in this example, in order to transmit data zero, the code word that is actually transmitted under air is the orange code word here. If the Wi-Fi device wants to transmit data one, then it will transmit the green code word here. Once, based on the input data, the corresponding code word will be selected to transmit over the air. Our key observation that enables the hitchhike system design is that the Wi-Fi only uses a fixed number of the code words for data transmission. Let me give you a very simple example. In the 11B Wi-Fi transmission, for one megabits per second data transfer, the number of the code words the Wi-Fi is using is actually just two. So, and another key observation here is that actually we can transform the code word from one code word to another code word within the same code book. Let's look at the same example here. The two code words, the orange code word and green code word here, are actually similar, except you can basically convert the green code word here to the orange code word by multiplying the green code word by minus one. We can do the same thing for the orange code word. We can convert the orange code word to the green code word by multiplying by minus one. That's the key of the observation. The code word within a code book can be transformed from one to another by performing some simple operations. Let's see if the tag can perform such operations, how the tag can encode its information. Let's, this, in this example, the tag wants to transmit data zero. It's basically just the just to reflect the same code word to the Wi-Fi receiver. It does not perform any code word translation. When the tag wants to transmit data one, 
the backscatter code word will be different compared to the incoming code word. That's how the tag encodes the information. In summary, if the tag wants to transmit data zero, it, the backscatter signal code word will be exactly the same as the incoming signal code word. If the tag wants to transmit data one, it will perform code word translation, convert one code word from the incoming signal to another code word in the backscatter signal. The key question here is how can a tag perform such code word translation at extremely low power? Let's look at this example here. If, you, if the tag wants to perform the code word translation, it needs to introduce the operation of multiplying by minus one. So how does the tag introduce the operation of multiplying by minus one? Well, if you think about carefully, what does minus one mean? If you look at the physical signal, if you multiply the physical signal by minus one, what does it mean? It actually means that it's, there is a 180 degrees phase change on the signal. As long as the tag is able to introduce such 180 degrees phase, diff phase shift during the signal reflection, it's able to perform the code word translation. So the question here is how to introduce the 180 degrees phase shifting? Well, an intuitive answer is let's just use phase shifter, right? It's a hardware you can buy from the market. The phase shifter is a very dedicated hardware that is able to introduce a desired phase shifting based on your configuration. You can do this, but however, such phase shifter can introduce roughly 500 microwatts power consumption. And if you put this hardware on your tag, you cannot do microwatts Wi-Fi transmission anymore. So how to perform the 180 degrees phase shifting? Another possibility is, is to introduce in the delay on the signal. In this particular implementation, we introduce five nanoseconds delay on the signal and as a result, we can see the 180 degrees phase shifting on the signal. Such, phase, uh, such delay only consume roughly one microwatts of power consumption, which is, helps us to achieving, uh, achieve the goal of microwatts micro, uh, Wi-Fi transmission. So having discussed about how the tag transmits the, uh, perform the cold word translation, let's, let's go through the, this process again. When the Wi-Fi transmits a signal, the tag reflects the signal to the Wi-Fi receiver by performing or not performing the code word translation to encode its information. The Wi-Fi receiver will receive the backslider signal, which is still a valid Wi-Fi signal, and based on the code word it observed, it will decode the tag data. It sounds like a great plan. However, at the same time, the Wi-Fi receiver here will receive the signal from the Wi-Fi transmitter here. And unfortunately, the signal from the Wi-Fi transmitter, this guy, is much louder compared to the backstairs signal. It's more than 30 dB higher compared to the backstairs signal. As a result, the Wi-Fi receiver cannot hear the backstairs signal at all. How to solve this problem? There is one paper published in SICOM this year. The idea is that the reason why the receiver cannot decode the backsider signal, that's because of the backsider signal here share the same spectrum as the incoming Wi-Fi signal. As long as the tag can perform some operation that moves the backsider signal away from the incoming Wi-Fi signal, then the receiver is able to decode the backsider signal without worrying about the interference from the Wi-Fi signal. Such operation can be done by generating some special signal on the tag. The reason is that the backsider signal here, the B here, is actually the time domain product between the incoming Wi-Fi signal S and the tag local signal T. As a result, 
when you increase the frequency of the tag local signal, you can move the backstage signal away from the incoming signal. This is a great idea. However, such operation actually produce two sideband of the signal. On the right side here, we have the desired backstage signal that we want to decode the tag information. However, on the left side here, we also create another copy of the backstage signal, which is the undesired signal. This such, such signal here, the left signal here, will cause interference for other Wi-Fi transmission or other signal transmission on the ISM band. So how to cancel this part? Ideally, we, we don't want this part at all. We want to cancel it out somehow. And the way we perform the cancellation is to use the signal splitting. We take the incoming signal here. We split the incoming signal into two parts. In the first pass of the signal, we will keep the same copy of the backstage signal, which has two sides of the back spectrum, as this figure shows, which is exactly the same as the original backstage signal we created. We created. Then, on the second pass, we create another version of the backstage signal. This version is slightly different compared to the first version. On the right side, the backstage signal is exactly the same as the, pre, as the signal on the first pass. On the left side, the backstage signal has a reversed phase compared to the, first, the signal on the first pass. Then, we add these two copies of the signal together. The left side of the signal will cancel with each other, and the right side of the signal will remain the same. That's how we produce the single side band backscatter. And one of the CCOM paper this year, which actually used a similar idea, but we have a very different implementation. So to, how to decode the tag of information? Let's look at the truth table between the tag uh, data versus the incoming Wi-Fi signal. We can see that if the tag wants to transmit data zero, the backstage signal here is exactly the same as the incoming Wi-Fi signal. If the tag wants to transmit data 1, the reflected signal here will be different compared to the incoming signal. In summary, the backsetter signal here is actually an XOR between the tag data and the incoming Wi-Fi signal. So decoding the Wi-Fi, decoding the tag data becomes much simpler because we can, as long as we are able to XOR the backsetter code word versus the incoming Wi-Fi code word, then we can recover the tag information easily. This is a hardware prototype of our system. It has four, uh, four major modules. The first, the first module here is envelope detector. This module identifies exactly when the Wi-Fi exciting excitation signal starts. The second module here, RF switch, it performs the signal reflection and embeds its information. The third module here is a FPG, which runs a code word translator. And the last module here is a power management module. And the hardware and the software of this platform is available on this link. And to ensure that the community can reproduce our result. So we, in order to evaluate our system, we did this evaluation in the Stanford building and we put the Wi-Fi transmitter and the tag in one place and we move the Wi-Fi receiver away from the tag. The Wi-Fi transmitter we are using is the Intel 5300 Wi-Fi transmitter and the Wi-Fi receiver we are using is an Apple MacBook uh, laptop. In this experiment, we want to understand how the hitchhike system perform across distance. When the Wi-Fi transmitter transmits at the 15 dBm signal, we can see that we are able to achieve roughly between 200 and 300 kilobits per second data rate at close distance. The maximum distance between the tag and the laptop is roughly around 42 meters. When, we, when the Wi-Fi transmitter at transmit at 30 dBm, we actually can, be, can operate much longer, long, uh, more than 50 meters. This experiment was done in a line of sight uh, scenarios. 
We also performed the similar experiment in the non-lion site experiment a scenario. We put the tag and the Wi-Fi transmitter in one room, and we moved the Wi-Fi receiver across the corridor, so we, the signal will propagate across several walls. So we can see that at close distance, we observe roughly 200, between 200 and 300 kilobits per second data rate. The maximum distance that we can operate is 32 meters. And we uh, show a demo that, that's the first demo that enables the backs, that is able to uh, do the ECG signal transfer on top of the Wi-Fi signals. So we have a Wi-Fi transmitter, transmitter here, which is the Intel 3, uh, 50, uh, 300 Wi-Fi transmitter. We have a Wi-Fi receiver, which is my laptop here. And I will show you, and this backstage tag is a, a plug-in with a um, ECG sensor. And I will show you that we can, uh, the Wi-Fi receiver receive the Wi-Fi packets and extract the ECG signal, display the ECG signal in real time. What you can see is that the, uh, we actually don't uh, have much interference and we can get very accurate uh, signal from the ECG sensor at the laptop while backstaring only the Wi-Fi signal. And the source code of this demo, the software hardware, is also available on the uh, link that I provided. So to ensure that the community can reproduce the same demo as well. So in summary, I just introduced the hitchhike system design. It's the first backstair system that is able to do backstair communication between commercial Wi-Fi devices. And it's a very spec uh, it's a spectrum efficient system, which significantly reduces the uh, uh, in increases the efficiency of the spectrum usage of the backscatter. It's able to provide 100 to 300 kilobits per second data rate at a distance of 10 meter to uh, 30 meters. And we are we know that our current system only works for one tag, and we are expanding our system to multiple tag scenario. We are actually designing a Mac layer protocol for the hitchhike system to support multiple tag communication. The code, the software, the hardware is available online. If you guys are interested, please talk to me. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Questions? Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm curious is if uh, the Wi-Fi transmitter has to produce a very special Wi-Fi packets, or uh, if you can opportunistically use the traffic that is already there. That's a, good, a great question. Um, the, con the payload of the uh, Wi-Fi packets does not matter because of the when we XOR perform the XOR operation, you basically have a two copy. One is the original Wi-Fi packet, one is the modified version. So as long as you can do the XOR between the two versions, you can extract the tech, tech data. In, so the payload of the Wi-Fi package does not matter, but uh, you want to have a Wi-Fi package that is transferred at a very high data rate. Very, I mean, the packet interval should be very small in order to guarantee that you deliver sufficient amount of data from the sensor. If I can continue the question, uh, why you want, uh, in the end, to XOR with the original packet and not just uh, basically use the bus cutter to encode a different symbol? Uh, because the backstair tag does not know what's the content of the Wi-Fi packets. Okay, thanks. Because we don't want to make this assumption. It will, if you make this assumption, you are basically you are assuming that the, the user is transmitting some dedicated packets on the one channel, which is actually, you are reducing the spectrum usage. We don't want that. We just want to use one Wi-Fi channel to do the backscatter. Thanks. Hi, I'm Tingjun from Colombia. So my first question is that, is there a reason that you picked the 11B standard, or does it scale to other Wi-Fi standard? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, 11B is simpler, because uh, it's using the DSS plus the uh, PPSK, DPQ basic modulation. So it's a simpler, so that's the first uh, system we implement and prototype, but we can do the OFTM as well. Uh, the second question is that uh, if you are able to create a sideband spectrum because you're moving the spectrum from, from the central spectrum to the, to the right side, uh, does it mean that you're actually occupying more spectrum there that you're supposed to occupy or will you introduce other problems if you're using like a sideband signal? 
what you, I think what you are uh, seeing is that the how to avoid the interference from other uh, Wi-Fi transmitter. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's actually a good question. So what we do right now, there are two possible solutions. The first solution is to move the back third signal on the channel 13. We did a measurement and we found that channel 13 is actually not very heavily used. So you will not uh, experience very se uh, severe interference in Stanford, in New York, and in Brazil. We did a three uh, location test. Uh, the, the other solution we are actually thinking about is that you, ideally what you should do is that you should have a Wi-Fi transmitter, oh, sorry, the Wi-Fi receiver here, uh, which will send the CTS RTS message to reserve both channels, ideally, but uh, you might have some um, implementation issues to, for reserving two channels. Yeah, okay. So, but Thank we are looking at this problem right now. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Edward Dongri from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, great talk. Uh, so here it was pretty convenient that your code words were separated by a 180 degree phase shift. If there is some other modulation which uses a different phase shift, uh, is there, would a similar method work out? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the reason why we, I, we just described the 180 degrees phase shifting, that's because of the, I, the, my example is one megabits per second uh, Wi-Fi transmission which use only two code words, and the, the difference between the two code words is actually the 180 degrees phase shifting. But if you move to the high data rate, even for the 11B, for example, if you uh, think about the uh, uh, what 11 megabits per second uh, data transfer, they're actually using 64 code words, not only two. And the difference between these two, these code words are not only phase, and the phase, the difference between the phase is not, is not uh, only 180 degrees as well, but you can also uh, use a delay to create different phase shifting as well. Okay. And, but for if you want to uh, change the amplitude or that, you might have to have a slightly different uh, RF transistor, RF switch that is able to um, uh, make sure that you are able, when you do the back setter, you are able to create some uh, amplitude modification as well. I see. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Okay.